Hey everybody, Jen Hatmaker here. Welcome to the For the Love podcast. I am absolutely delighted to have you. I am in love with the series that we're in. We are doing a series called For the Love of Reconnecting. And we just kind of sat down together as a team and said, where are we at right now? Where are we personally at? Where's the community at? Where's our country at? Just so disconnected, Um, literally because of COVID, disconnected politically, disconnected ideologically. We're disconnected from our neighbors, from our people, from each other. So we thought, how, what can, how can we surf? How can we pull together the greatest thinkers and leaders and experts that we know um, to help us begin the work of reconnection. Um, So sometimes one of the bravest things we can do to reconnect um, is with ourselves. And what could be more true as we sort of jump headfirst into a brand new year? So I know that all of our stories took a wild left turn last year. And sometimes it is easier to just let go for a while and let things happen as they happen and just kind of say, I am a victim of circumstances or I have no control. Um, But I wonder what might happen if we decided to put our hands back on the wheel and start to take a little bit of that control back, maybe just a little bit at a time. I wonder what it would look like for you to do that, to say, I may not control everything that happens to me, but I can choose what I do about it. I can choose how I respond to it. I can choose what I make of it. Um, There's value in that. This is good work. It's hard work, but it's super important work. So you guys just buckle up today because lucky, lucky us. My guest today is someone who knows all this. She is in the business of helping people rewrite the stories that they tell themselves. And you know her. Lori Gottlieb, you know her work. It's incredible. She's everywhere for a reason. Lori is a therapist. She's the author of the New York Times bestseller, Maybe You Should Talk to Someone. If you've been around me at all, you heard me yammer on and on about that book the first time I read it. Um, it is phenomenal. She In it, she talks about her own work as a therapist and about her sessions with her own therapist. Um, so it's very vulnerable, very transparent. Um, oh, and P.S. Eva Longoria is currently adapting that book into a series on ABC. So that should tell you how great it actually is. Um, Lori also writes the Atlantic's weekly Dear Therapist advice column, um, contributes to a million other places, of course. Her recent TED Talk was one of the most watched talks of 2019. And lucky us, she is also the co-host of a new iHeartRadio podcast called Dear Therapists. We talk about this uh, podcast later in the show, and you are gonna wanna, you're going to want to download this one, you guys. It's essentially free therapy. It's also, fun fact, produced by Katie Couric, because Katie knows a good storyteller when she sees it. Um, Lori has meant a lot to me personally. I've considered her um, a teacher and even a mentor through her work, which I have devoured and then used, used when I really, really needed it most. And I'm so glad that I get to tell her that today. You're going to love this conversation. I mean, it's packed. This one is just packed with like wisdom and self-compassion, next steps. I mean, we really kind of get down into the weeds on our own mental health and our own stories and how we treat ourselves and what we're telling ourselves. So I'm so glad you're here and you are going to be too. So pleased to share my conversation with the absolutely wonderful Lori Gottlieb. Lori, I could not be more delighted to welcome you to the For the Love podcast. Thank you so much for joining me today. Oh, thank you. I am so glad to be here and to be able to chat with you today. When I tell you that I ripped through maybe you should talk to someone, I mean, I, I read it at every possible second until I was done with it. It was so um, captivating and illuminating. I, the combination of your insight, but also your like vulnerability was not something that we get to see every day. Um, and 
I, I turns out I really needed that message as the year went on. And so I'm so glad that I had put your words in the bank account and had them to draw on. I've told my listeners a little bit about who you are. And of course, tons of them are already familiar with your work. Uh, Maybe it's the book or your Ted talk or your advice column. Now your podcast, dear therapist, congrats on that. Um, You're just putting out a lot of good stories and ideas into the world. And so I know this is a really high level question, but if you just had to summarize what message you are trying to put out there with all of these projects, if there's a through line, what would it be? And why is that so important to you? Wow, that's a great question. I think that if there's a through line amongst all the things you mentioned, the book, the podcast, the column, the TED talk, I think it's about that we're not alone. Hmm. that we are all more similar than we are different. Hmm. I say at the beginning of maybe you should talk to someone that my most significant credential is that I'm a card carrying member of the human race. So, you know, in the book, I follow the lives of these four patients. And then there's a fifth patient in the book. And that fifth patient is me as I go through my own struggle um, and go to therapy. And I feel like that was so important that we are all the same. We can't see it at first. I think what we see is difference or we see otherness. Mm -hmm. Um, We see otherness in ourselves. Like I'm, I don't fit in or other people have it all together Mm -hmm. or I'm the only one struggling with this. And yet when you really get to know other people, you find out that, wow, um, I am not alone at all. We are all so similar. And, and I think that so many people struggle alone because they have that misconception that something is wrong with them right. when nothing is wrong with them. Mm. Right. It's the cost of human life. It turns right. out we get joy and we get sorrow and nobody is exempt from either. But it is true that suffering feels lonely sometimes. Well, it does. And I, and I think part of it is that, you know, if there was another theme throughout all of the work, it's, it's that we grow in connection with others. And I feel like, you know, what happens between two people is so important. Mm-hmm. And if I, it, when I think about like all the letters I get to my column or to my yeah. podcast, um, I think that the theme is, is kind of like, how can I love and be loved? Mm-hmm. And, and what we'll do in the service of trying to both love someone else and how hard that can be sometimes when we have, you know, issues in relationships. And then also how hard it can be to, um, to feel like we are loved. Mm. And, and I mean, love, not just by other people, but to love ourselves. Mm -hmm. Because I'll tell you when I, when I do public speaking and I'll, I'll say to people from the stage, you know, show of hands, who's the person that you talk to most in the course of your life? You know, raise your hand if it's your partner, lots of hands. Is it your, is it your best friend? Is it your sister? You know, who who is it? Um, I get lots of hands for those, but the person that we talk to most in the course of our lives is ourselves. Good. And what we say to ourselves isn't always kind Mm. or true or Mm. useful. And so when I talk about loving ourselves, I I had this therapy client who was so self-critical and she didn't believe me. And I said, I want you to go home and write down, listen for that voice and write down everything that voice says to you in the course of a few days and come back here. And she was mm. very skeptical about this, but she came back and she had it all written down in her phone <laughs> and, and she comes back, she starts to read and she said, I can't read this. I am such a bully to myself. And I had no idea. And they were little things like, Oh, you made that mistake. You're so stupid. Mm. Like a minor mistake that if your friend made that mistake, sure. you would not for a second think she is stupid or just like she'd wake up in the morning and go, you look terrible. God, you're so ugly. Right. Yeah. It's like you would think your friend looked beautiful. Hmm. That is a profound exercise. And I want to talk more about that because this particular episode that you and I are discussing right now, this, this whole series is on reconnection, just feels like the whole culture is disconnected right now. We're disconnected from each other, from our neighbors. But this idea of being disconnected from ourselves is a big one. 
and harder to navigate for most of us. I think some of that interior work is just more challenging to access. I've heard you say many, many profound things, but one of my favorites is this, and this is a bridge from what you just said. Um, You wrote, the way we narrate our lives shapes what they become. I'm really interested in this and um, really hyper aware right now of the way I narrate my own life. Can you talk more about this? Yeah, that's such a big theme in maybe you should talk to someone and also in my TED talk about revising our stories and how that changes our lives. We all are walking around with stories. Our lives are stories. Mm -hmm. And what happens when somebody comes into therapy is they're, they're stuck somewhere in the narrative. So people come in and they say, here's what's going on. But the thing is, because we're human, we're all unreliable narrators. I don't mean that we're not telling the truth. What I mean is we're telling the truth as we see it. You're right. And so there are other versions of the story that are equally true, Hmm. but depending on what we leave in and what we leave out and what we emphasize and what we minimize and kind of like who the major characters and who the minor characters are in the story and whether that's really the right balance. Hmm. um, Usually the protagonist, meaning the person who comes in is instead of moving forward, the protagonist is going in circles and they can't get to the next chapter. And so I feel like my job as a therapist is almost to be an editor, to help people to edit those faulty narratives. And some of those faulty narratives are are faulty beliefs that they have about themselves. Mm -hmm. So I always say that when people come to therapy, I think that people think that they're coming to get to know themselves better. But I like to say that people are coming to unknow themselves, Hmm. to let go of the faulty stories that they've been telling themselves about themselves that are holding them back. Hmm. And and I think once you can see yourself more clearly, you start to see the people around you more clearly. And that's where growth and transformation happen. Hmm. I want to ask you more about that. I'm curious because you uniquely have your finger on the pulse of our kind of collective mental health right now. And you have an insider's uh, view here on what's going on in a lot of our lives. I'm I'm wondering, I'm curious if you are seeing certain stories, certain um, unre- set certain false narratives, maybe um, the the lies that we've told ourselves and now we believe and live out of um, themes that are coming up over and over again. Because again, to your earlier point, we sometimes feel alone in what plagues and ails us, but we probably aren't. Um, and so I'm wondering if you are seeing collectively. Um, these are some some bad stories people in general tend to believe about themselves. Yeah, I think that, you know, certainly of late, the story that people tell themselves is, I have no control, I am helpless. Ah. Mm. And, and yes, it's true that there are circumstances over which we have no control, but here's what we do have control over. Mm. We have control over our response to the circumstances. We get to choose how we respond to any circumstance. And Mm. so what I found is that the people who say, well, there's nothing I can do and everything's horrible. Those people tend to experience depression, anxiety. Um, You know, they really struggle, but the people who say this is really hard and I am going to do something um, with this circumstance. So what can I do to make change in the world? What can I do to help change circumstances? What can I do to take care of myself and the people that I love? Do I need to take a walk right now? Do I need to read a book right now? Do I need to call a friend and connect right now? Do I need to minimize the time that I'm talking to people who spread negativity? And I don't mean that you should be, you know, a Pollyanna and be, Mm -hmm. um, you know, kind of naively optimistic at all. What I'm saying is you have to be realistic about Mm -hmm. what's going on so that you can help to make change and also help to take care of yourself and those around you. I will say that in households, one thing that spreads like wildfire more than the coronavirus or equally Mm. is anxiety, um, negativity. So the people who are not taking care of themselves are are spreading that because it's contagious. Mm. So we have to take care of ourselves so that we can also help to take care of others and also be cared for by others. 
Oh, I just feel like you have been spying on my house and <laughs> all of ours. <laughs> my own too. I, I feel very um, seen in that. It is true, but I've also noticed the flip side is true that um, self compassion is also contagious. Um, that in the same way that negativity can just leak out to everybody else and just raise the temperature in the house, so can kindness. And so can, again, I really, I appreciate what you said a second ago, not in a Pollyanna way, but um, in some sort of stable way to really ha- grab a hold of our own like well being and mental health. I notice that when I am prioritizing that, my kids do better. Mm hmm. You're right about feed off my energy. Yeah, absolutely. And you're so right about self-compassion because self-compassion breeds compassion for others. The thing about self-compassion, here's a big misconception about it. People think that if I am kind to myself, if I have compassion for myself, I won't hold myself accountable and I won't grow or change or succeed in the world. And yet the exact opposite is true. If you self-flagellate, if you beat yourself up, You might think that that's going to hold you accountable and make you more productive, make you kind of, you know, Mm. really, really move things out in the world. But the reality is that if you beat yourself up, you are going to be so drowning in shame because that's what beating yourself up does. It, It makes you feel ashamed. It makes you feel bad about yourself. And then you start to say, oh, I'm not good enough. Oh, I'm, I'm not competent. I'm not capable. Or just, I'm so ashamed of who I am or what, what I've done. So instead of doing that, you can say, look, I did something that I'm not proud of but I'm human. And so I'm going to forgive myself and I'm going to learn from the experience. And part of the forgiveness isn't you give yourself a free pass. Hmm. It's I forgive myself because I'm learning from it and I'm going to do something different. That's where the forgiveness comes from. Hmm. And so then you can say, I can have compassion for myself and I can hold myself accountable at the same time. And you'll find that when you are self-compassionate, that you succeed so much more in the world. You're so much more productive. There's so much more positivity going out in terms of what you create in your, in your own family, in your community and society at large. Hmm. Yeah. I really appreciate that, that that is not a binary option. It's not either, or, um, that is really great advice as I'm thinking about, um, just this idea of reconnecting with our, with ourselves and with our stories. And I know for a lot of us, and this would include me, there's primarily like one version of our stories that we tell ourselves. Most of us don't really deviate much from it. Um, Or in fact, for a lot of us, there could only be one explanation for something that happened in our lives, whether it's like interpersonal or it was circumstantial. Um, We sort of, I I have this way of, of distilling something down to a reduced version of what it was and then just cementing over it. That's it. It's an, it's an, it's in pavement. Um, So I'm curious as someone who helps us work through, because some of the things in our stories are sincerely painful and there's real suffering. I don't mean to make light of the things that we've experienced, but how often do you find that to be actually true? That the versions we have crafted and cherished are the only way to imagine our lives and, and what's gone on in our lives? I think that that is one of the most powerful things that people learn when they start to revise their story. So we all get locked into a story yep. and, and it, ha- it accumulates over the years. The story starts to take shape and then it just gets solidified. Yeah. Um, and in, in maybe she talks to when I talk about the difference between idiot compassion and wise compassion. Mm. So we tell our friends stories time. Here's what happened. Um, here's what my partner did. Here's what my coworker did. Here's what my sibling did. Here's what my parent did, whatever it is. And we say, yeah, 
they're wrong. You're right. That's terrible. I can't believe that happened. Right. That's idiot compassion. Because if you listen to your friend's stories over time, they are locked into one version of a story. Um, And so it might be different people, different, you know, a different anecdote, but the theme is the same. And the theme Mm -hmm. is I've been wronged. Yeah. So in therapy, what we offer is wise compassion. Mm -hmm. It's those compassionate truth bombs where we help you to see your story And we we kind of hold up a mirror to you and help you to see yourself in a way that maybe you haven't been willing or able to do. And and that's where you can start to say, wait a minute, this very rigid, one-dimensional version of the story that I've been telling might not be the whole story. Hmm. And that's where things get exciting because now there's the possibility of change. Mm -hmm. There are these people that we all know that are called help rejecting complainers. And uh, you might be able to figure it out just from the name, but a help rejecting complainer is a person where they come to you all the time and they say, I'm stuck in this situation. Um, You know, I don't know what to do. And then you try to help them. You're saying, well, actually, what about this? Or what about that? Mm -hmm. And they're like, no, that won't work because no, I can't do that because no. Right. So they want your help, but they'll reject every offer of help you give them. They just kind of want to complain because they're so invested in that version of the story that they Mm -hmm. don't want anything to change. And so that's important to look for too, you know, and look for in yourself. Like, am I a help rejecting complainer? I think we all at one point or another have been help rejecting complainers. Sure. I know I have. Yeah. Um, and so it's just important. You can help yourself in that way to say, wait a minute, am I rejecting every possibility out hmm. there? Yeah. Oh, that's, those are deep waters. Um, that level of kind of self-examination and really self-honesty, that's That's where it's usually for me the most challenging um, because it requires facing or admitting something I don't like about myself, something or something I knew I did wrong. But again, Um, that's where the judgment comes in. And that's why the self-compassion is so helpful because you can move forward without the self-compassion. You're right. That is what makes that possible. Do you know what's saving my life right now? (laughs) Making time to talk to my counselor. I'm serious. I mean, even when it feels hard, even when I don't want to some weeks, I always feel better. After I take an hour and talk to her about how to move forward, you can start making time to talk to a counselor today too. With my sponsor, BetterHelp. BetterHelp matches you with a counselor and you can send them a message anytime and get a really timely and thoughtful response back. Plus, you can schedule weekly video or phone sessions with your counselor and you never have to sit in an uncomfortable waiting room. BetterHelp is committed to getting you the help that you need. So they make it easy and free to change counselors if you need to. I want you to start living a happier, healthier life today. So as my listener, you can get 10% off your first month by visiting betterhelp.com slash for the love. So join over a million people who have taken charge of their mental health. Again, that's betterhelp, H-E-L-P, dot com slash for the love. Okay, back to our show. I want to talk about change. You just mentioned change. Um, Change is always going to be a part of our lives. And um, some of us are better with it than others. Um, But sometimes people say they want change. But you say that often when we say we want change, we really mean we want someone else to change. (laughs) Absolutely. It's very upsetting that you know this about us. Um, Can you talk more about that? And this whole idea of boundaries and relational dynamics and what is mine and what is yours I feel like this is the work of my adult life and I'd love to hear what you have to say about it. So, so many people come in and they say, you know, this, something's not working in my life. I want something to change. And then as they keep talking, everything that they want to change is this other person in their life. Totally. Um, if only and, they would and, behave. 
Right. And, and I want to say that, that um, you know, it's not that there aren't difficult people out there. Of course, there are difficult sure. people out there. Um, I remember when I was doing my internship to become a therapist and I was training, one of my clinical supervisors said, before diagnosing someone with depression, make sure they aren't surrounded by assholes. <laughs> right? Can I say that on here? <laughs> That's amazing. <laughs> so, so, so yes, you know, you can get really so depressed great. surrounded by assholes. Yes, you can. Um, but then what is your response, right? So then it's questions like, why are you in relationship with this person? Or what are you doing yeah. that perpetuates the, the dance that you do with that person? Sure. So, you know, we, there, if you look at couples or you look at people, even if it's like, when I say couples, it could be you and your sibling, it could be you and your parents, it could be you yeah. and your best friend. Um, what happens where you have the same argument over and over, just in mm. different ways over the, you know, different things, so but it's sort familiar. of the same dynamic. Yeah. That happens. And what are you doing to break that pattern? So mm. it's kind of like people are always engaged in a dance. And if you change your dance steps, meaning you do something different, yeah. That person will either have to change their dance steps too, or they'll just fall flat on the dance floor and there's no argument anymore. Mm. So I think it's really important that we say, wait, I have the power to change the dance yes. that we're doing. And, and the thing about changes, you know, it's so funny because I, I think I should say that I think human beings are ridiculous. And I say that in the most affectionate way. Yes. And, and I think we need to be able to both take our lives seriously but to be able to laugh at ourselves too. I know exactly what you mean. And so I think when we look at how we talk about, I want something to change. And we always say, especially around New Year's, we make these resolutions. Sure. Like, I'm going to change this. I'm going to change that. And then often it doesn't happen. And that's because change is really hard. It requires mm. us to give up something that we are very invested in, which is the familiar. So right. human beings don't do well with uncertainty. And so inherently, when you change, you're going into something that is uncertain, that is unfamiliar to you. And so often people would say, they don't say this consciously, but there's a part of them that says, even this thing that is miserable or that is unpleasant, whatever the circumstance is, I would rather stay in this familiar situation than venture out into something new because I am terrified of the uncertainty of yeah. something new. And so we say we want to change, and then we do everything in our power to guarantee that we will not change. Totally. Just the exact same dance steps. I'm learning about this right now. Um, this is, I'm like so many of us, like most of us, honestly, I'm in the middle of a really hard year, a specifically hard season. And I'm kind of learning about codependency in a way that I hate um, because it's just so very frustrating to figure out that um, some of the stuff that I would just prefer to put right on somebody else is mine to own. Um, and so these relationships that this dynamic that you're talking about where you get really locked in to dysfunction um, or just constant chaos, the same circle to drain behavior that never changes. Um, is it's got a tricky bedfellow in codependency, um, which can also um, do a wonderful job masquerading as victimhood. Um, and so I wonder if there's any way you could talk about that for a minute. This is really just my personal question. Um, yeah. I'd like to hear your, your wisdom when it comes to addressing our own habits, our own behaviors. It's so interesting that you mention this idea of, um, of drama and chaos and, and how that's related to codependency um, because drama and chaos are really like a drug. Mm -hmm. um, people can get addicted to that. And it's because they don't want to feel their feelings. And that's where sort of taking sure. ownership of your own feelings. They're so afraid of their feelings. But I think what people find is that their fear of their feelings is so much greater mm. than the actual fear that they're going to have once they feel their feelings. Mm. Um, and so what do people do to avoid feeling their feelings? And this is something that happens with codependency so much. Is it's, it's an avoidance of feeling your feelings. It's a yes. very much like everything's out there and it's so dependent on the other person. Yeah. Um, so what do we do when we don't want to feel our feelings? Well, 
too much food, too much wine, um, too much mindless scrolling through the internet, too much relational difficulty, like, mm-hmm. you know, the fights, the chaos, the drama, that's all a great distraction from going inside and feeling your feelings. Mm-hmm. And what I tell people is when they try to numb out their feelings is that numbness isn't the absence of feelings. Numbness isn't nothingness. Numbness is the sense of being overwhelmed by too many feelings. Yeah. And drama and chaos help us to numb out, to pretend we don't have these feelings, but actually we're just acting out all of those feelings yeah. that feel unspeakable to us that we can't actually mm. express to ourselves. Mm. So I think that an awareness that you are in a codependent situation is the first step. You have to say, wait a minute, I realize that it can't be all the other person, yeah. that I am part of this too. Yeah. And then the question is, what part of it am I? And, and it's really about you know, taking care of yourself. Mm-hmm. It's so, so a lot of people are so afraid to look inside because they say, I'm not going to like what I see. What I find as a therapist is people love what they see. Oh. I don't mean the, I don't mean that, that in those nice. initial, you know, in those initial yeah. phases, I mean that they're, they have so much shame that they're, they fight so much against who they are, but I think what they come to see is how lovable they are mm. um, to other people and to themselves, that they don't need to pretend to be someone else. They don't need to hide out. They don't need to have the mask on. Um, it, you know, so many people come to therapy and they say, I wonder if my therapist likes me. Yeah. And I'll tell you that when people show me the truth of who they are, mm. I can't not like them. Like mm. I instantly like them. Yeah. And I think that's true out in the world that if someone shows you the truth of who they are, mm-hmm. not with the pretense and all the defenses and all the ways they try to protect themselves, you will immediately find some connection with that. That's the glue that holds humans together. That's what I'm drawn to. I am drawn to sincerity. Authenticity. Yep. I am. And I can spot it and I can smell it. And same, I can smell its absence pretty quickly. Um, And it's so true that when people take the risk of being genuine and transparent and authentic, there's this fear that that will push people away, but it's the opposite. It draws me in. It, It tells me this person is trustworthy. I can trust this person with my stuff. Um, and so it really does have the opposite effect of the fear. As you mentioned earlier, the fear is the worst part than what actually happens. Right. And also you will attract healthier people into your life totally. because the people who don't respond to the authenticity mm. are the people who haven't been able to experience that themselves. You're right. Those are the people who are so afraid of, of showing up, of being present. Um, so those, you're not missing out on anything. So if those people don't right. accept you, don't yeah. embrace you for, for the truth of who you are, mm. um, you're not missing anything. Mm. Great point. And what you'll find, it's a good weeding out process because then yeah. you'll find, oh, these are the people who do see me. I think, you know, in, in couples therapy, so much of the time um, people say, you know, what are the three words that you really want to hear from your partner? It's not, I love you. It's, I understand you. Yeah. That's so I good. think we all want that. I see you. I hear you. I understand you. And when you show up, the people who matter, the healthy people that you want to bring into your life are going to respond to that. Mm. I want to talk about um, a moment in maybe you should talk to somebody. It's such a phenomenal book. Um, and you modeled for us what vulnerability looks like um, as a, not just a therapist, but as a client. And so, you know, obviously you talk about your own therapist, you call him Wendell. And so one day you're telling Wendell about a particular situation that you're going through. And he tells you about a cartoon um, (laughs) of a person behind bars in your head, kind of, can you talk about that cartoon and why for you, that was just kind of a mind blowing moment. Yeah, this was really a game changer for me. And I, I use this with people all the time. I'm always quoting this comic um, and sharing it with people. So it's basically a cartoon. And he says to me, I'm complaining about all kinds of things and how helpless I am and how there's nothing that can be done. And my life is terrible. And, you know, all those things that we get into those ruts. And, um, and he just pops and he says, you know, 
you remind me of this cartoon and it's of a prisoner shaking the bars, desperately trying to get out. But on the right and the left, it's open. Yeah. No bars. Yeah. The prisoner is not actually in jail. Mm. And it's really about this idea that we are our own jailers so much mm. of the time, that we are the ones who are imprisoning ourselves mm. with this mindset of I am trapped. Mm. And what it, what, it, right. what it really brought up for me was this idea of, well, if the bars are open, then why don't we just walk around them? Why are we so reluctant to just walk around and walk to freedom? And the reason is that with freedom comes responsibility. Mm. If we are free, then we have to take responsibility for our lives, for our choices, right. for our decisions, for what's working, what's not working. And sometimes it's easier to just shake and say, I'm trapped by everyone and everything, instead of saying, wait a minute, I'm responsible for my life. That there's mm. something scary about that. But there's also something incredibly empowering and liberating about walking around those bars. Mm. You're so right. Um, you said earlier, it's just a word that has been real resonant for me when it comes to this sense of, uh, I'm not in control of everything. This is all happening to me. Um, you know, I'm sort of the victim in this scenario, which is just that we actually have a lot of power. And this is the loop that I am playing for myself right now. Is that Jen, you are powerful, even in, in the middle of just a complete explosion. I mean, even in the middle of a full unraveling of, of something really important or really precious, even then, even then. Um, I, I, I'm powerful. I am power. I'm, I have power in how I respond. I have power in the messages. I start telling myself, um, inside that moment, powerful in the way that I am in the house. And so there is something really strong about that, about grabbing that with both hands and refusing to let go. I wonder if you could guide us a little bit on some of the this is such an inside job. Like nobody can do this for us. That's what you're saying. It's we are responsible for our life, period. Just period. What, what is this internal language that you would say, these are the things to begin to work into your, um, the, the voice in your head that you tell yourself all the time. You're your best conversation partner. And then these are some things to listen for that should raise some red flags. If you are saying this to yourself over and over, um, you may be like dipping into a dark territory. Yeah. Well, first of all, I think just noticing the voice. So many of us don't even know. It's kind of like there's like a radio station playing in the background. You get the TV on in the background yeah. or whatever. Um, that's that voice in our heads that we don't even notice it. You're just going yeah. about your business and you don't even know it's on and it's yeah. playing. And that we can actually change the station. We can like grab the remote. We can like turn the station on our, on our, yeah. on our iPhones. Um, you know, like we can listen to what we want to listen to. And I think that when you have that kind of abusive voice inside mm, of you, and I use the word, word abusive because it, you know, it sounds like a strong word, but it's really abusive over time. Why would you talk to yourself that way. If you talk to your friends that way, you would have zero friends. It's so true. And not because you're trying to be nice to them, but because you truly don't believe that about them. Mm -hmm. And so we see ourselves very differently from how our friends see us. And I think that if we can view ourselves through that kinder lens, and again, this isn't about not being accountable, not saying, wait a minute, here are things I need to change. Here's what I'm responsible for. Mm -hmm. It's about saying, I'm going to be kind to myself, no matter what I'm going through, that mm. being, you know, cruel to myself doesn't help me in any way. It doesn't help me move forward. It doesn't help me change. It doesn't help me be a better person. It doesn't do any of that. So mm. I think the first thing is just to notice that the voice is there. And you can do the exercise that I gave to my therapy client of write down, mm. just listen for it and write down what the voice is saying, just so you have a sense of what's going on. And then when you start to notice it more, give another version of that story. So when you say like, I'm such an idiot that I made that mistake, you can say, gosh, I'm really hungry. I made a mistake. I wasn't really thinking I need to go take care of myself and have lunch. Mm. It's, it's three o'clock and I haven't had lunch. Right. That's a different right. response. Yeah. Um, where I look terrible. It's like, mm 
wow, you know, I am so hard on myself. I don't need to be so hard on myself. Mm. Or the comparison thing. We do that constantly, especially with social media. Um, there's so much comparison going on. And the problem with comparison is that it either makes you feel superior to, to other people, which is sort of like this narcissistic place, like I'm better than other people. That's a, a kind of a false self. It's not a real, I feel good about myself. It's in comparison to other people. I feel yeah, like I'm, I'm better, better. Mm-hmm. but it's, it's, a, it's, it's false. It's flimsy. It's not mm-hmm. like a real solid sort of um, feeling of self-assurance. Mm-hmm. Um, and the other thing that happens with comparison, which more often happens is I don't measure up everybody else is better than me. They're more attractive. They're more successful. They're more together. They're more emotionally healthy. They're, um, they have better partners. They have better kids. They have better parents. Hmm. Uh, they have better jobs. Right. Um, and that's not helpful either. And it's also just generally not true. Hmm. Like you don't know people's stories. From right. Social media. And I can tell you that when, because I get to hear the real stories every day is that there are, of course you do. The reason that I wanted to bring people into the therapy room and let them be a fly on the wall is that I wanted them to see the human condition because I knew they would find themselves in these people. And what's funny is the people that I chose for the book are these four seemingly very, very different people. And again, since I'm the fifth patient, I'll include myself. All five of us seem very different from one another and maybe from the person who's reading the book. But by the end of the book, all the readers say, I found myself in every single person. It's so true. Right. And so I think that that's really important that we don't compare based on social media. We don't compare based on who we saw, you know, wherever the story we heard, because you don't really know what's going on in someone's life unless you actually sit down with them and you have an honest conversation with them. It's so, it's just the truest thing. I mean, I can even just look right here in my real life, in my actual community that's pretty small, pretty tight, pretty controlled, um, and just kind of tick through each of our little families. And I'm like, oh, just nobody really knows what we're all going through. And it looks one way. I, my life can definitely look a little shiny and polished. And it's, it's actually um, comforting to know that virtually every person around you is hurting or they've been, they've hurt before. Um, they've lost, they have failed. Nobody gets through this thing unscathed. I don't know where we got that idea. Well, that's right. I mean, if you're human, you are going to struggle at some point or another in whatever way you do. Nobody is immune from that. Yeah. And especially if you're engaged in life, like right? if you're going to take the risk of loving and loving deeply, you're going to struggle at some point or another. You're right. You're right. That's the, that's the risk analysis. Like it's the, it's the, it's the price of admission. It's the price of admission and you don't get a guarantee um, that you're going to go all in and not be hurt or betrayed or lose. Um, I still contend it's worth the price. Um, there's There's a real power in even recovery. Recovery is a crazy growth point that I don't, I don't really have access to any other way than pain and recovery. There's a, there's a woman in the book who is young and she's in her thirties and she's diagnosed with cancer. And at one point she says to me, why do what, why do people need a terminal diagnosis to really live the life that they want to live? Why do they need that to kind of wake up? And I feel like struggle is kind of that way too. Like with COVID, a lot of people are saying all of a sudden, wait a minute, I'm getting my priorities straight. Mm. I'm realizing what's important to me. I'm realizing sort of where my emotional real estate is going. And here are the people that are important to me. And I want to prioritize those people. And here are the things and the people that I don't need to really um, put my energy toward in the same Mm. way. Yeah. So I think that, that it's through struggle, it's through these kind of life-changing events that clarity comes to us. You're right. It does. It does. And that can be a real gift if we choose to see it that way um, and to learn from it instead of just get buried in resentment and victimhood, which that's an that's a easier reach. 
to be honest. <laughs> you don't even have to reach. It's right no, there. It's right there for the taking. But I also think that that just because, you know, when I'm thinking about that woman with cancer, that, you know, one of the things that we talked about was how life has a hundred percent mortality rate. And that's not for other people. That's for all of us. And yeah. so when we have an awareness of the fact that we have a limited time on this planet, mm. um, I think that it makes us really motivated to pay attention in yeah. a different way, right. to really right. pay attention, to not sort of get mired in the struggle, but to move through the struggle. Yep. Great stories are powerful, right? That's why I love this podcast. We get to hear people from all walks of life talking about their obstacles and their wins. And you know another place we get to do that? The Gin Hatmaker Book Club. And I want you to join today because if you love this podcast, you're going to love the book club. Here's the deal. Each month, we'll dive into a fantastic book and we read all kinds of stuff, fiction, memoirs, self-help, all of it. Every single book is something I have read and loved and I just know you will too. After you sign up every month, I'll send you a box with the book and other fun treats. Plus your membership comes with a whole slew of perks. You get resources like reading plans, weekly summaries, discussion questions. Plus you get tons of exclusive community stuff. You get access to our private Facebook group where you can connect with me and all your fellow members. And there's a monthly Facebook live chat session with me and sometimes some surprise guests. Sometimes I pop into the Zoom meetings of our local chapters, which is always delightful. Plus we do some cool stuff with the book's author. They curate these awesome Spotify playlists just for us. Plus I record a podcast with the author or another special guest and we talk about the book. It is an incredible way to cap it all off. And you know what makes a book club great? the people. This community is the kindest, most supportive group you can possibly imagine. They have definitely been saving my life in 2020. Join us. So sign up today at jenhatmakerbookclub.com. We are here waiting to welcome you into the sisterhood with open arms. So join us at jenhatmakerbookclub.com today. Okay, back to our show. Before we wrap up here, I'd like to talk for a minute about your podcast, Dear Therapists. It's kind of like getting to be like a fly on the wall by meeting these people who are in session with you. And then we also get to meet up with them later and hear about their progress. It's like a wonderful glimpse um, inside other people's stories. It's, it's a really cool premise. Can you talk about it? What you're loving about it? Um, maybe is anything inside of it surprising um, or, or showing up in a way that you d- even you didn't expect? What I love about the podcast is that we, people come in with a problem. Um, they write us a letter. I do it with my co-host Guy Winch, who's a psychologist in New York and a fellow TED talker. And um, he's the <coughs> advice columnist. He's an advice columnist for TED. I'm the advice columnist for The Atlantic. But in our columns, you don't get to find out what happened right. after we give the advice. In the podcast, you do. Yep. So, and you get to actually sit in on a session. So somebody writes in a letter, you hear how two therapists think about people's everyday problems. And then you hear us take someone in the course of an hour from a place of stuckness to a place of action. And we give them a concrete, actionable homework assignment that they have one week to complete. And then they come back, you'll hear it all in one episode, but they come back a week later and they tell us how it went, what worked, what didn't, why. And what we found so far is that every single person has moved so far from the place they were when they came to us in that one week that they have made incredible changes in their lives because they were held accountable. It was like, you have one week to do this. Yeah. So you might have been procrastinating for two years now on doing this, but you have one week and they know because they have to come back and report it on the podcast, but they don't, they don't want to be embarrassed. So, so they do it and it's just been Mm -hmm. magical. So I think that, I think people think about therapy and they think, oh, you come in and you talk about your childhood forever and you never leave. Therapy is actually a really action-based endeavor. We are dealing with the past in terms of how it informs where you're stuck in the present, but we're really focused on the present and how you can really craft the future for yourself. And in the podcast, you get to hear that happen in a single hour. 
Mm. It's um, free therapy for the rest of us listening, which is incredible um, that we get to just helicopter into some really similar relational dynamics and circumstantial issues, get your advice, take your homework, do it our own selves and all for the bargain price of nothing. Um, and so thank you for making that so available to the rest of us. It's incredible. Well, another response to the podcast has been that even if the person doesn't, even if listeners don't share that particular issue that week, so many people have said, you know, there was one, for example, about like a, a mom dealing with a blended family yeah. and her stepdaughter yeah. and someone who was 25, not yet married, didn't have kids yet, um, said, I know nothing about parenting, but I used that with my coworker at work. And it was totally. really some of these like best practices apply to virtually every relationship. So That's yes, right. we can uh, take a lot of that and transfer it to our personal experiences and lives for sure. Um, okay, Lori, we're going to leave the plane here. And these are just sort of three questions that we're asking everybody in this particular series. And you can just answer top of your head. Okay. Um, because again, this series is about reconnection. So for you, what is your favorite way to connect with other people? Do you have a favorite thing? Do you have a, this is what I love to do, um, like in a relationship space? Yes. Um, I like to laugh and I like to dance. Oh. <laughs> and so, so in our family, we like to have spontaneous dance parties just to cute. kind of shake things up and do a yeah. reset. Yeah. That's so cute. Do you like to go dance like in a, in a dance club or is it more like dance in my kitchen? Oh, absolutely not in public. Oh no, nobody wants to see me dance except for my family. <laughs> no, it's like, just like spontaneously, you know, break out in, in like, you know, dancing in the living room. That's a great answer. Perfect. Okay. How about this? Um, maybe in the middle of your day, sometimes when all of a sudden you find that you are wound tight, um, that your anxiety is starting to spike or your thoughts are starting to dip. How do you take a moment or a few moments, whatever it is that you do to kind of reconnect with and care for yourself. You know, all day long when you're sitting in front of a screen, there's all this incoming stuff that raises our stress levels. It's emails, it's news, it's, you know, everything about what we have to do, what we haven't done yet, what's going on in the world. And so for me, I like to take breaks during the day and it, you can take three minutes Hmm. And I go into a different room or I walk outside yeah. or I look out a window and I take 10 breaths in very slowly and 10 breaths out very slowly. And I stretch my arms and I touch my toes and then I go back and hmm. I feel like a new person. Just like getting back in your body. Yeah. Just reconnecting with yourself, feeling yourself, feeling your presence, feeling your feet on the, on the floor, feeling, you know, just moving your body and also looking at something that is bigger than you, like a, like outside, like a tree, the sky. Hmm. Isn't it so interesting that these sort of low brow approaches just still work? They really do. It's not they, fancy. It's not complicated. It's not expensive. You don't need an app. You just need, you mm -hmm. just need your and, and, you know, just something else to, to reset yourself. And everybody knows what that thing is for themselves. For yeah. me, it's nature. I really yeah. like to see, you know, the sky, the trees, but for somebody else, it could be something else that relaxes them. Last question. We ask every guest in every series, this final question and feel free to answer however you want. Big, small, important, silly. It could be any answer. We've, we've got them all. It's from a priest that I love. Her name is Barbara Brown Taylor. And she asks, what is saving your life right now? <laughs> okay. My real answer. Yeah. That's what we want. Tra Trader Joe's um, movie popcorn. Oh, this is not the first Trader Joe's appearance on this answer. You're kidding. Trader Joe's is here for us. <laughs> it um, certainly so is. That's your favorite popcorn. That is my, my favorite popcorn. And it just, um, you know, since we can't go to the movies right now, yep. um, it's something that makes me feel like I'm at the movies, but I also just like it because it reminds me of being a kid and being at the movies or like in our family, like making popcorn. Um, and so, um, yeah, I just, that's, like I have to have that in the house. 
I actually get a little bit anxious. Like, yes. if, if I find out, like if I see that we're getting to the bottom of the bag, oh. like, just like, oh my gosh, we have to make sure we aren't gonna, it's like toilet paper in our house. Totally. Oh, that's a great answer. Listen, the little pleasures in life right now are getting us all through. I think that is, I'm so happy that you said popcorn. That just made me so glad. Um, can you just tell my listeners where they can find you, um, where they can get your incredible work? Um, and then let us know if there's anything you're working on right now that is in the, in the pipeline that, um, you haven't had a chance to tell us yet. Sure. Well, people can find me at my website, which is lauriegottlieb.com. They can get my book. Maybe you should talk to someone wherever they get their books. They can read my Atlantic Dear Therapist column every Monday at theatlantic.com. They can listen to my podcast, Dear Therapists, wherever they listen to podcasts. And they can watch my TED Talk, um, which is about how changing our stories can change our lives at ted.com. And I am working on a new book about how we love. Good. We're ready. When do we get it? (laughs) After I write it. (laughs) (laughs) Darn it. That is how it works. That's how it works. I got to write the thing. (laughs) Unfortunately, that is the way that actually goes. Um, Thank you so much, Lori, for your work in the world for the way that you've chosen to use your gifts, but then also share them with such sincerity and authenticity. It, it has served, I I mean, I can't even imagine it'll be, it would just be an amazing number to think about how many people have been really impacted by what it is you do. And I am one of them for sure. And so um, just, I'm really proud of you, really proud of, of how you are living your life and the way that you are leading us into wellness and goodness and just relational stability and inward stability. It's incredible. It's, we need you now more than ever. Please don't quit. Please don't, oh, well, do not quit I've, on us. I'm not, I'm not quitting. We're bringing the, the TV series of the book to everybody, which I think will, will sort of make emotional health even more okay. accessible. And I just want to say, I am such a fan of your work. I've been following you for years, um, reading, listening, um, you know, talking about you, my therapy clients talk about you. So That's it's so it's such a pleasure to be able to have this conversation today. What a nice thing to say. Okay. Until next time. Thanks, Lori. Thank you. Okay. I told you it was all in there and I was not lying to you. Um, Every wonderful resource and piece of work that Lori just mentioned, we will link for you all in one place. Just go to jenhatmaker.com underneath the podcast tab. We'll have it all, all of her socials, all of her work, her book, the Ted talk, everything. So you can kind of have a Lori one-stop shop over there and we'll have the show notes for you too. Um, This is a good one to share. You guys share this one with your folks, with your people. Um, and you do that a lot. Thank you for always sharing our, uh, our shows on your own social medias, or you just send them to your friends, to your kids, to your parents, to your siblings. I love that. This is going to be one of those. This is definitely going to be one of those. This is your, what you're going to do is share this and it's an hour of free, free therapy for whoever you give it to. So, um, if you haven't already subscribed, go do it. Subscribe to the, for the love podcast. We are so grateful for our subscribers Thank you for rating and reviewing the show. We read all of your comments, all of your suggestions when you let us know what has been meaningful to you and what you're still hoping to hear. Guys, so much more to come on the For the Love of Reconnection series. I mean, this is maybe one of our favorite series we've ever put together. So um, I hope it serves you well. I hope it lifts you up and encourages you and in some way helps us begin the work of reconnection. Hey guys, see you next week.